So let's talk about why um, I have more than 100,000 US dollars in this 20 specific names in my portfolio, accurate as of 15th of March 2024. So just recently, I've actually posted this on both my X account and also my YouTube community, which actually garnered quite a bit of um, well-intended and meaningful um, discussion and pointers, which I will further explore in the later part of this video. But specifically, I guess this is essentially the overview or the goods for most of you. It's a bird's eye view in terms of what are the ticker symbols in my portfolio right now, the percentage weightage of um, each individual position, and the percentage gain and losses of each individual position. So here's the interesting thing. There are a total of 20 names right here. Um, you can look at um, column J, which essentially depicts um, the number of greens, the number of red, and the magnitude of each um, counter. So out of these 20 names, there are three red, one that broke even, which means that the other 16 names are all green. But that's it, the overall returns profile of this portfolio is sitting at a whopping negative 6.31%. Because the largest laggard in this portfolio is also the one that has the highest weightage. We'll talk more about it later on. So I think before we dive deeper into each individual counter and walk you through my thought process, I think it's important to kind of understand me um, a little bit better. So I've personally been using Tiger Brokers platform for at least the last two years. So they have a very, very intuitive layout, which makes the entire investing, trading, chart reading experience a very enjoyable and comfortable one. So their in-house community is active and they have very interesting in-app mechanisms that allows you to accumulate Tiger coins that can then be used to actually redeem rewards on the Tiger Trade app itself. So on top of the existing sign-up promotions for new users, which includes commission-free trades for Hong Kong, Singapore, China, and even the US market, you can get free fractional shares of Apple if you fulfill the requirement. For those of you who use the link below and fund another 2,000 Singapore dollars within seven days after your first deposit, you actually get an additional 30 US dollars worth of Tesla shares. So I've been an avid user of Tiger Brokers and I hope to see you there. So sign up link will be in the description box down below. Thank you Tiger Brokers for sponsoring this video. So before we go into that, I think I just wanted to start out with a quote from Professor Damodaran, who's essentially the Dean of Valuation. And I quote, In my valuation class, I start by saying, If I truly believed in efficient markets, I would not be teaching this class. If I truly believe in efficient markets, valuation is just an exercise in explaining the price. So I believe markets make mistakes and we can find those mistakes. Then I use the word faith. I think that investing is an act of faith. When you value a company, you have to have faith in your value. And you have the faith that the price will correct to that value. So if people ask me to prove that my value is right, I can't because I'm making assumptions. And if they ask me to prove that the price will adjust to value, I can't do that either. Unquote. So I think that's something that all active investors out there have to acknowledge. So here's my backstory and my thought process. First, I'm clearly not a growth investor. I suck at imagining things, especially those projections or forecasts going out into the next 10, 20 years, saying that how big this total addressable market is and how this company is gonna disrupt this entire region or disrupt this entire sector. So I get a natural allergic reaction when I hear companies trading at 30 times price to sales. Price to sales, by the way, not even earnings. I think 30 times price to earnings, it's kind of the norm and the median right now, um, specifically in the max seven names, but sometimes 30 times price to sales. Do you know what's that concept? The concept is basically today, if a company is earning um, X amount of revenue, let's say $10 million, assuming that it has totally no costs, no cost of goods sold, no operational costs, they don't have to pay the salary of their workers, and on that revenue, you are paying 30 times of it. I just don't understand. Of course, many people argue that, hey, um, particularly so for many of these companies that are trading like 30 times, 40 times price to sale, um, they have a huge growth runway ahead. They're extremely small today. They're going to be extremely big next time, which goes back to my main point again. Um, I suck at imagining things. So that's why I kind of still stay in my lane in trying to invest in companies that have a proven track record of producing profitability and stuff like that. So point number two, I think that being a cheapskate is part 
part of my DNA, but it also comes with its own set of trade-offs and challenges, which we'll discuss a little bit further later on. Point number three, I look at investing in companies on a value versus quality continuum. Intuitively, higher quality companies generally trade at a premium, uh, vice versa. Of course, not barring any major crisis. So in major crisis era, you would expect prices to be corrected significantly. But that's it. I think this value quality continuum um, stays generally intact. But buying everything cheap is also not the answer to investing. There are many instances of value traps. So I guess um, this is the million dollar question. What's the answer? Do you buy quality at any price or do you buy cheap for no quality? I'm going back to the basics and the foundation of the stock market. It's an auction-based system. It's governed by millions of humans making daily transactions. And I think intuitively, um, human beings are emotional in nature. Um, that's why you have this huge price volatility in the markets, at specifically the public markets. And the most important question you have to ask yourself, um, what's your edge or what's your advantage in this entire game? So I think my framework is rather simple. Um, know how the company make money and why you want to own it, why you think it will continue to be bigger and better in the next five to 10 years, which specifically boils down to one question. You need to figure out their mode or if not, figure out their competitive advantage. Why do you think other competitors cannot come into this space and to steal their lunch? Point number two, I believe a sweet spot for growth to be right between eight to 12%. It means that the company is not too young because they don't experience that sort of exponential growth and they're also not too old. Point number three, valuations should be attractive enough. Personally, um, I cannot fathom how any investor is willing to pay any price for anything. Um, specifically, just looking at a company thinking that because it's the highest quality company in the world, you are willing to pay, let's say, $10 trillion of valuation for the company. And I think there are so, so many empirical studies out there basically trying to find out the relationship between the valuations you pay versus the expected um, returns profile that you will get. And intuitively, um, they are of an inverse relationship. So the higher the valuations you are willing to pay for a particular asset, naturally, the expected returns profile of that particular asset will diminish. So personally, I try to look for at least companies that give a 3 to 4% free cash flow yield and ideally a forward P of less than 20 times, unless um, they are temporarily hit by something adverse, which kind of skew that number. And point number four, companies that are leaders in their own domain or have proven their worth with the track record and competitiveness. And a plus plus here, because I think it's important, because having a recognizable brand means that you can protect your margins and it also means that you have a competitive advantage or an economic mode in this case. Point number five, I think at one point in time, I was given this nickname, Tay Falling Knife King. Um, basically, I love companies in distress and companies that have an extremely ugly and unlovable chart. So particularly when the market is giving up on them. And don't forget, on the flip side of that same coin, a momentum is actually working against you. Point number six, on my accumulation process, I prefer to accumulate over time rather than to go with that one shot, one kill um, sniper theory. So that's why I always initiate a position of less than 1% to put in my portfolio. Because like they said, if you have no skin in the game, you probably wouldn't bother. So I have a list of companies that I follow that are in the research process. I have a list of companies in my portfolio that are less than 1%, which I follow much more closely too um, with their earnings report, um, their quarterly earnings and their yearly earnings. And I actually do love bears because they basically help me do free research. Um, they will come up with very fanciful and very fascinating ideas um, to basically prove their point right and to prove me wrong. Um, and they are the best research analysts out there and they're free. So that's why I always love putting out content and to put out my ideas to basically get challenged by other people. They help me spot my blind spots and over time, I hope that I become a little bit more wiser. And of course, the last point is just a reminder to everyone there. Remember that the market is an auction-based system. When you buy something, someone is selling it to you and you need to be comfortable to know that either one of you is right and either one of you is wrong. So of course, we aim to be more right than more wrong, but don't expect yourself to be 100% right all of the time. I don't profess to have the golden formula or the recipe to successful investing, but it's something that I can stand behind for now. So I'm in the accumulation phase right now. I'm in my mid-20s and I want to accumulate shares of great companies for the extremely long term. 
Uh, by long term, I'm looking at my time horizon of at least 40 to 50 years. And over time, I have a greater appreciation of indexing, which is why I want to include a base layer of indexing in case everything I touch goes to zero. And this is basically my form of insurance. And hopefully that the ETF that tracks the world won't go to zero. And the ETF of my choice here is VWRA, which is around 60 plus percent US and they have more than 3000 companies. Um, from emerging markets all the way to developed markets. So specifically for this indexing approach, I'm using an enhanced DCA approach to indexing. So simply put, because many of these indexers are breaking all-time highs, so I don't wish to not have the dry powder to accumulate when they go down. So what I do is to establish a very low base effect um, and I'll just DCA this um, every fortnight or every month. So And I'll just set rules behind it. Specifically, maybe if the index falls 10% from its all-time high, um, I'll increase my DCA amount by 50%. And if it goes down by 20%, um, I'll increase by 100%, so on and so forth. And, and which is why this base layer of indexing, this fixed amount that I'm putting in monthly cannot be a high amount or cannot be a large amount in proportion to my expected cash flow and expected income. And because if you have to set a base amount too high, you can't increase your position sizing by such a large extent. So that's why I kind of have more flexibility in terms of this um, enhanced DCA approach. But that's it. I think personally for myself, um, I love this investing game. That's why I'm allocating a lot more capital to individual names. Um, I think just to give you a flavor or to give you some context. So comparing the amount that I set aside um, between individual names versus indexing, I think it's a ratio of one is to four. And last but not least, I like to minimize movement, meaning I don't like to buy or sell a lot. Um, specifically, I'm quite resistant to selling. I like to hold on to many of these um, great companies. Um, at least that's based on my own personal assessment. We will have time on our side to see who's right or who's wrong. So this is basically the bird's eye view of the individual positions in my portfolio today and some of the important metrics that I track, um, specifically like gross margins, operating margins, um, the price to free cash flow, um, the forward PE, which are valuation metrics, and business metrics like ROE and ROIC. And you can see um, there are seven specific categories. Chinese tech, Chinese banks, US tech, discretionary, defensive, REITs, and growth. So I think to someone new that is not an avid follower of me, um, you might think that this breakdown is extremely messy, but there is a story to it. I think long story short, um, just to give you a brief overview, I started my investment journey in the Singapore market. And then moving forward, um, there was this democratization of investing in the US market. There were many competitive brokers coming in. That's when I took a dip in um, the US market, buying many of these US tech stocks and US banks. And after that, um, run up. This was in the 2020-2021 um, era. Um, right after that, I saw great value in Chinese tech, which is why I pivoted completely into um, Chinese tech companies like Alibaba and Tencent. And when we went into that 2022 bear market, um, that was when I started picking up many of these US tech and some of these discretionary names um, in my hopes of trying to diversify the portfolio. But that's it. I think in order for this portfolio to be more representative, I actually don't consider those positions under 3% to be meaningful. And when we look in terms of the portfolio breakdown, um, it's those highlighted in yellow that are more than a 3% portfolio allocation. And I'll come back to them later on. So specifically for Chinese tech, both Alibaba and Tencent is my two largest position. And if you just count them together, um, they actually take up around 50% of this portfolio. And I'm still extremely bullish about them. And I think many people have been complaining to me, hey, Chi King, why are you making so many Alibaba or Tencent videos? So I guess now you know why. So I think in general, um, the Chinese tech scene is extremely mispriced um, due to how unloved it is. And because so much um, attention is being drawn away from them, um, that's why I think there's this outsized opportunity um, from a risk reward perspective. You can see that I think most of them are not trading at demanding valuations. In fact, they're extremely, extremely cheap. But I would like to also acknowledge the point where if you were to track their business metrics from a gross margin, from an operating margin, from an ROE, ROIC perspective, um, if you plot the five-year chart, um, they have been punished or they haven't been doing very well. You can attribute it to um, the tech crackdown. You can attribute it to the slower economic growth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but specifically for Alibaba, there are also competitive pressures and a loss in direction. So I think many of these things compound on itself, which basically explains um, the state and the sorry plight of the Chinese tech names today. I'm still a big believer and I'm extremely optimistic of this space, which is why I have an outsized allocation to them. Um, they haven't been paying off, but I keep my eyes peeled. I really do have a very long-term horizon in seeing them turn their things around. And specifically, I think I did mention in some of my videos, or at least in most of my videos, I'm still bullish. 
I think they're easy doubles, easy triples from their current valuations. And from a risk reward perspective, I think the risk is quite capped in how um, things are positioning right now. So moving on, I think the third largest allocation is actually Chinese banks at around 8%. So for these Chinese banks, we can't really price them or we can't really look at them from this general price metrics because financial companies is a whole different beast. But um, I think one important factor for most investors is that they look at the yield. And Chinese banks right now, they are in a very precarious position. Um, they are being laid on by many investors. They are being berated because of their exposure to the property sector. Um, that's why they're trading at like 8 to 10% yield. I put 8 to 9% because um, there is still a dividend um, tax from the Hong Kong exchange. I believe it's 10%. So I actually only receive around 8 point something percent in terms of yield. They are trading at historical lows of their price to book ratio. Some are trading at 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. I think most investors are not afraid of the low valuation. Objectively, everybody knows that they're trading at low valuations. But I think the bigger worry is really how um, they're going to collapse in this uh, developing story, um, specifically when many people are burnt by the Citibank um, back in the great financial crisis. I think they were at $40, $50 and they dropped to $1 because of massive share dilution. Um, the government basically strong armed them, etc. etc. I think for the Chinese banks specifically, why I'm so resistant to sharing the names is because that um, I'm, I'm going to admit this is quite a speculative position, which is why I kept. Um, in terms of my exposure and many of the dividends that are going to come back to me I'm not reinvesting back into them and if I'm not wrong on a cost basis I've kept this onto a 5% exposure and how I invest or how I take an approach into this is really um, kind of similar to the approach when Buffett went into the Japanese conglomerates he basically bought up a basket of them um, for my Chinese bank exposure um, I also did the same approach I basically bought up a basket of them and they haven't been doing too badly um, despite all the murmurs and the discussions around um, the Chinese property collapse. I think moving down, I think Amazon, Meta, Google, they all make up around 4 to 7% of the portfolio. Um, I have been talking about them on and off um, through the last two years. I've been net accumulators of them. I enjoy Amazon. I think that they're also mis mispriced back then due to their crazy negative free cash flow profile. Their advertising um, component of their business is also heavily um, under monetized. And that's why I accumulated Amazon back then. I think they have paid off um, pretty okay. And I'm actually averaging upwards because I think that they have been filing on all cylinders and I want to be a bigger shareholder. I haven't accumulated enough. Um, next up on Meta specifically, I think Meta platforms have had their beating um, from three four hundred dollars down to ninety, and then right now they enjoyed this massive rally. Um, kudos to everyone that held on, but there was some um, key business changes specifically to the AI model and the integration of AI. I'm not saying that it, Meta before um, 2022 or before 2021 wasn't incorporating AI, but I think there were some leaps and bounds in terms of their open source um, AI model and integration. And and really this paradigm shift and their work around around um, the AI privacy changes. So if Meta wasn't able to work around it, I think they wouldn't be able to kind of um, post such fantastic results. But really, I think kudos to those that sat through the entire roller coaster like myself. I've made at least more than 10 videos on Meta as well. Um, I, I believe that not a lot of people like to watch because those Meta videos tend to tank. But I guess just stick with your investment principle and, um, and don't be too impatient. I'm always eager to see results in the next quarter or two. Um, a lot of these names actually took quite a few quarters in order to turn around. Um, that's just my general opinion. I think Google, similarly, Google and Meta, they monopolized the advertising industry. Um, Google has also taken a beating um, specifically because a lot of all these recessionary talks, advertising is not going to do well. It's compounding in nature as well. And Google right now um, is also facing their second adversity when people are talking about chat GPT, etc. Um, I'm still optimistic. I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm looking at Google. And specifically, if you do look into this category of US tech, um, other than Amazon, I think I did accumulate all of them under 20 times uh, price to free cash flow and forward PE. But the nature of Amazon's business is slightly different. That's why I value Amazon differently. Um, in terms of their ROE, ROIC, I think some of them are posing great numbers. But let's not forget, one year ago when I was accumulating them, all of these numbers looked disastrous. Seriously, it was a bet against the market when everyone was basically belittling uh, many of these tech companies' ability to continue churning out profitability. So I guess um, they still look pretty good right now. 
Now, moving on to discretionary. Um, by discretionary, I mean that they don't really fall under any specific category. But specifically for TSMC, um, they are in the semicon industry. You can see that they are quite cyclical in nature. And I was accumulating TSMC um, in the down cycle. And one of the biggest bad theses for TSM was specifically geopolitics and how Taiwan is going to play in this entire picture. And the funny thing is, um, TSMC continue to climb. You can attribute it to this entire AI wave. But let's not forget, it's the darling of Taiwan. And if you really believe in this whole China is going to invade Taiwan narrative, um, TSMC is not supposed to go up so quickly. So that same narrative is not true for TSMC, but it's true for some of these Chinese companies. So I think the 30 second pitch for TSMC is relatively simple. They are one of the most important companies out there. They have one of the widest economic mode. Um, they managed to outdo Intel in their main business um, purely um, due to how they conducted their business and the nature of the model, which is they want to be a pure play manufacturing. They're not going to design the chips. Um, they make their business relationship upfront to their customers, which is why Apple trusts them wholeheartedly. Apple 100% source their chips from TSMC. Um, I believe Nvidia also source 100% from them. There is no um, conflict of interest. And I think building on the good relationship that TSM have with Apple, um, I think Apple is a locked in customer for life, at least in the foreseeable future. And you are just leveraging on the relationships that TSM has managed to build with their customers. So that's what I kind of like of TSM. And it's kind of a proxy bet on Apple. Now, I think moving on to LVMH, I think it's also one of the highest quality companies out there. Um, I didn't manage to accumulate a lot, to be very frank. Um, I wish to be a net accumulator of LVMH over the long term. Um, they are basically like an ETF of luxury. I'm still trying to monitor and study that space. I don't profess to be a very huge luxury uh, insider or advocate. Personally, I don't even use luxury, but and I want a piece of this business because from a business owner perspective, the margins are incredible and I don't foresee how luxury is going to play a much smaller role moving forward in the foreseeable future. So I think specifically for Hai Tilao, um, it's a consumer bet for the Chinese consumption story. Um, they're the biggest hotpot chain. They are basically a service-based, service-focused company um, that is masked under a hot pot chain. And they have a very interesting internal promotion business. And that's why I just wanted a small piece of it to kind of just monitor. So I think as you can see, I think congruent to my own investment strategy, I tend to look at companies with an expected growth of between 8 to 12%. Um, there are some that are posing incredible results, but I'm not too sure how... Uh, sustainable it is specifically for this AI wave but um, this is the universe of companies that I look at um, they are big in their own rights but they are not those um, very old very matured kind of business they tend to trade at an attractive valuation and also let's not forget um, some of these numbers and for most of these US names um, they basically grew their valuations now if I were to look into the whole suite of names that I have um, I think just some very brief explanation. So I didn't actually include Meituan in my portfolio. It was a free share um, issued by Tencent. It was, a, it was a special dividend. That's why I didn't really bother about them. And it's because it's odd lot. Um, I didn't really care about them. And I procrastinated a little. I think back then Meituan was trading at over two three dollars a share. I think right now they went down to $70, $80. As kind of something to remind myself um, of the results of procrastination. Now, Adobe, Adobe is a very small um, weightage in my portfolio. Um, I do love them. I do believe that they're one of the greatest SaaS company out there. Um, valuations are a little bit hard for me to swallow. And this whole AI generative um, video takeover, I'm still trying to monitor. I haven't really been accumulating. I think for S&P Global, um, I think one of the very strong financial companies as well. I haven't been accumulating them aggressively, also from a valuation perspective. Now, moving on to defensive, which is Thermo Fisher and Hershey's. Um, they are basically clones of Adam. I think Adam has been talking about um, some of these defensive companies. Um, in fact, they are the ones that are going against my um, investment framework. I don't like to accumulate companies that don't really have huge growth um, tailwinds behind them. But um, I do see value in terms of having some defensive exposure in the portfolio, but I'm not going to make them a huge part of it. Maximum, I think 5-10% exposure. Now, moving on to REITs, I think I'm accumulating some of these REITs um, in the Singapore market. They've been beaten down badly because of the interest rate regime and uh, maintaining higher for longer. Uh, most of them, they are at a 3 to 6% yield range, and they are usually one standard deviation away um, from their historical price to book ratio. You might be thinking, hey Chi you are very young. Um, why are you accumulating REITs? Um, REITs is a very defensive strategy. Dividends in general is a very defensive strategy. Um, to me, um, uh, I, I like to seek where value is at. I do see great value in some of these Singapore names and I'm owning some of the most prime assets in the Singapore piece of land. So you have prime office buildings, prime malls, um, prime medical properties 
what's not to love about them. So I don't look at them from the lens where I want to be a dividend investor or I want read exposure or I want to play defensive. Not really. I see value. I I deem some of them to be unfairly beaten down. There is not only this dividend um, returns that forms the base layer of the returns, but I also see some decent uh, potential upside that I can read from these read players. And I don't necessarily see read as a different kind of monster. Let's also not forget their businesses being run by um, read managers that has to be um, benchmarked against their performance as well. So that's just my general thoughts around reads. And for me, I think reads as a asset class should be five to 10%. Right now, I think they're around 3.5, 3.6%. So there's still a long way to accumulate. And if Mr. Market decides to throw a tantrum, I'll be more than happy to accumulate some of this great um, reads that are run by great managers. So that's just my general thoughts. So I have nine core positions in my portfolio and I monitor this quite closely, meaning I'll look at their quarterly, their bi-annually report um, like immediately. So when they release um, the next morning, I'll take a look at them. Other than that, I think for the rest, I might be a little bit more lazy. I will procrastinate and I'll just maybe a few days or a few weeks later just to get a sensing and a understanding of their performance. So moving on, um, I think the last part of this video is to reply to some of these um, comments that I got from X and also from my YouTube community. And Batman said that that's a pretty good portfolio, difficult to market time. So only way is to keep some cash to be able to average down if it makes sense. What's the whole portfolio gains or losses? I think at the start, I did say that the whole portfolio gains are still at a negative territory. But on this idea of keeping cash, um, personally, I like to stay completely invested. Um, of course, I still have my own uh, emergency fund um, being kept aside. Um, I also have some exposure to money market funds to earn that higher yield. But other than that, I don't like to keep a lot of cash. I like to remain cash poor. So that's why when friends ask me for money, I tend to not have a lot. Uh, maybe a few thousand dollars I still have, but if you ask in the tens of thousands, I tend to not have that amount of money kept aside. Because I do believe that um, at a younger age, we are perpetually underinvested. So at any point in time, I always want to be invested at the maximum amount. But that's it, of course, uh, Mr. Market tend to throw a tantrum and when you have this great amount of opportunity, you want to bite the bullet and jump, jump at it. You have opportunities to kind of accumulate your position. You don't have to be very aggressive or very impatient in terms of building our position. I think that's just my two cents on that. Now, I think from Lewis, it's early to take that conclusion. You are so young, you have time to diversify. I'm also with big allocations in Alibaba, Tencent, and JD, and it's okay. And with time, we will naturally diversify with other businesses in the US and so on. And I completely agree. Um, specifically, I think this whole sniper approach versus having a diversified approach. I think if you're to let any investor look at my portfolio, 50% in two names, I think I'm still very concentrated. Uh, I don't know why uh, many people think I'm diversified, which goes to the next point. Um, PK, two diverse names, I will concentrate more. You are very young with long runway, no worries, it gets better with age. And there is a whole slew of YouTube comments, I think in a similar vein. So most of your choices are doing well. Buying Baba was not a mistake, but allocating such a large percentage of your portfolio to a single stock probably wasn't. In all humbleness, accept our ignorance and be a little benign with our confidence. We will do better. Agree? Owen Taylor, 20 tickers. That is really a lot. So many green. One even up 157%. But mere one red, which is your largest holding, drag you down a lot. Really cannot concentrate too much on one counter to diversify your risk. I learned that too. Even if you find a good buy, you can be early and it can take time to realize value in price. This is why finding a diverse range of good buys allows you to see returns on other stocks. Thus, you are not stuck waiting with no returns. You started with like one stock and way too big risk. Now about 20 stocks, so a bit better. But it seems like you are still lost. 0.29% Meituan, 0.45% SPY, 0.86% VOO and so on. What's the point with so low allocation? Your portfolio is almost like a strange index fund. If Meituan quadruples, you earn like pennies. Buy a global index fund or shape up and get a decent portfolio. So just a quick comment, 0.29% Meituan, that's not my decision. I actually would want to sell it away, but I just want to keep it as a reminder for a cause of procrastination. So for SPY and VU specifically, I think some of you might be confused on why I have these three different index fund. So VU and SPY basically tracks the same thing. Um, it's the S&P 500. But VWRA on the other hand is a globally diversified fund. I think just specifically for personal preference, I prefer VWRA over just buying SPY. So VWRA is actually listed on the London exchange. It's listed on the London exchange, they charge a greater commission. So buying on the US exchange, they charge like 0.35 
um, per order. So if I want to do a fortnight or a monthly buy-in, I'll rather buy it on the US exchange. And then what I'll do is every year end, I'll sell all my VOO and SPY to basically buy back VWRA. So um, 12 specific buys on every single month, sell everything and then buy one time with VWRA at a higher commission charge. I hope I kind of explained my thought process, but that's why I have this different exposure. So um, I, I think back to this idea of start off too concentrate, now it feels too diversified. I think if you, in the grander scheme of things, it's not diversified. I think I'm still very concentrated. I mean, at least that's how I think I'm playing my portfolio. So like a lot of your holdings and understand that you want to diversify, but think a lot of your smaller holdings could be removed as a lot of the big positions are already diversified. Like Amazon owns AWS, e-commerce, Twitch, Alexa, and on and on. That's just my two cents about it. And I think I kind of agree uh, many of these juggernauts that I buy, they are diversified in their own nature. But as we know, even though Alibaba is hugely diversified in e-commerce, in logistics, um, in payments, in cloud, and even in their venture portfolio, it's not enough. You can still see years of underperformance. And that's why I kind of do agree that I want to find a diverse range of good buys and not just um, concentrate in one or two names, which is basically my plight currently. So I think moving on to some of the more not so related comments. So Chiking, the lesson you are learning here is that you can buy too early. You are getting a lot of value when you buy Baba, but you aren't going to get the price we are looking for until the man who looks at squiggly lines start to buy as well. Um, basically looking at traders and saying that if there's not enough interest around Baba, um, Baba might continue to underperform. Specifically to this comment, I partly agree, partly disagree. If you don't really look at it from a very long-term approach, I think um, price will always track fundamentals. Basically, just how long would it take? Tobacco, he said that Alibaba is also my largest position in my portfolio. Could you please tell me which Chinese banks you are invested in? Like I said, I don't want to share because it's a lot more speculative in nature compared to my other deep dives that I have. And you can just search from my YouTube channel. I've made many presentations on companies like Alibaba, Tencent, um, TSMC, Meta, Amazon. I go in really deeper into their business model, etc. But for man many of these Chinese banks, um, I'm basically just taking a bet that many of these bad expectations have already been priced in. So I buy a basket of them and it's quite easy to kind of, uh, I guess, infer that what basket it is because there are only this few big Chinese banks and I just buy um, a whole lot of them and just diversify my 5% exposure across um, some of these names. And um, please do understand why I don't want to share. I have my own um, reasons. And I know that if I start talking about a particular bank, um, some of you might just close your eye and just follow me and buy into that specific bank. And I don't want this to happen. And I'm going to acknowledge this fact that um, the due diligence done on Chinese banks versus many of these other standalone names is a lot smaller in comparison. That's why I'm not comfortable or resistant in sharing the specific name. I hope you understand. And I hope that you enjoyed this discussion. And I think I like to occasionally put out many of such thoughts because um, you might think that you are learning from me or that I'm sharing my experience. But I tend to learn more and have people um, second check my idea and to challenge my way of doing things so that I become better. So with that, I'll see you in the next video. But more importantly, I'll see you guys on the moon. Goodbye.